Today we're going to be talking about the most famous monster myths in Europe. So if you like talking about things like legendary creatures, mythical creatures, cryptids, mythology, that sort of thing, we're going to be talking about some cool ones today. Europe's got some really cool ones. One of the best things I like about Europe is that it's just like so haunted and enchanted. Everywhere you go there's tales of ghosts and monsters and fairies because it's just like such an old place. But if you live in Europe, I'm going to be talking about monsters that are relative to you. Like places like Russia, Germany, France, United Kingdom, Greece, Italy, Sweden, Norway, Spain, Poland, Denmark. All those places I'm going to be talking about monster myths there. But quick disclaimer, if you're not comfortable with things like death, Thalassophobia, blood, death of children, medieval torture methods, then maybe this isn't the video for you because we're going to be talking about some of those things. It's also worth noting that a lot of these tales were just like eyewitness accounts or maybe they've been lost in translation or greatly exaggerated, which I'm not saying they're all true, but I'm also saying they're not fake. So um, just take it all with a grain of salt. I'm just here to like educate you about these stories and like what these creatures are and the lore behind them all. But guys, Europe is epic. We're going to talk about some bussin creatures from Europe. It's pretty sweet, so let's get into it. Alright, first one in Europe, we got Sweden and Norway, the Kraken. I gotta say, the Kraken has to be one of my favorite legends. Um, personally, to me, I really think that it's extremely possible that it exists. So as you know, 70% of the Earth is covered by the ocean. And of that huge portion of the Earth that's covered, 80% of the ocean has never been mapped, explored, or even seen by humans. So what's even crazier is scientists estimate that nearly 90% of ocean species could potentially not be discovered yet. So I mean, imagine what's out there. For example, this thing was newly discovered species in the Antarctica waters. It's extremely alien-like in every way. I saw this the other day and it blew my mind. It's got 20 legs and it really does look like a face hugger from the movie Alien. To make it even scarier, it can live at the depths of 200 to 3,000 feet deep. And it's a crinoid, so its closest relatives are like starfish, sea urchins, and sea cucumbers. However, this thing can swim freely, kind of like a jellyfish. So if this thing was just discovered in Antarctica after 10 years of research, imagine what else is out there. It's just hard to fathom. Like the Kraken. So why would there be a giant octopus or squid lurking in the depths? Well, to start off with, deep sea giganticism is real. And what that means is that deep sea dwelling animals tend to be way larger than their shallow water relatives because they have to travel across a much larger scale of water that's all just sheer nothingness. It's just a void down there so they have to go super far. So to go across this void they have to get massive to go quickly. So what the Kraken is is a legend about this sea monster of enormous size that's said to appear in the sea between Sweden, Norway, Denmark, and Iceland. The first time the Kraken was mentioned in history was from Scandinavian folklore in 1880 by the King of Norway. This king warned that there was this giant squid thing in the waters from Norway all the way to Greenland and that it would attack ships and terrorize all who would cross its path. And from these stories the Kraken became just like a sailor superstition but I really think it's much more than that. It definitely seems to me like the most realistic creature that could be out there. Like, I know a lot of you out there think that there's a lot of like land dwelling cryptids which could exist, like Mothman or the, the Skunk Ape and that sort of thing, but it'll be really hard for something like that to hide on land without people seeing it. However, the Kraken. I mean, that thing could hide and we'd never find it. I mean, it would, it's just, it's so likely to exist of anything like this. The Kraken was first described in modern times by explorers in the 1700s. They described it as a massive fish with many arms that would grab a hold of and sink ships. And it's said to be a separate creature from a sea serpent. Some of these explorers would describe it as having many heads or even having claws, which colossal squids definitely have claws. Like, here's a picture of the colossal squid's claws. It's actually really mind-blowing. So, like, maybe they described it accurately. Maybe they actually had encounters with a giant climbing a colossal squid. We'll see in just a second. Some would say, back in the day, that the Kraken was the same creature as another sea legend. And this sea legend that they had at the time that they said was similar was half Goofa from medieval folklore. Which, if you don't know, half Goofa is another sea monster which is said to be around Iceland, and it resembles this giant fish with a massive mouth that was said to come up to the surface and vomit up fish in an attempt to gather more fish. So it would throw up fish, more fish would feed it, swim in to feed on those fish, and then it would open its massive jaws and eat all the fish that come, came into that area. Which researchers suggest that this is actually a real thing. It's a specialized feeding technique from whales when they do this trap feeding thing. They open up their mouth really wide and it like 
unhinges like a snake's jaw and then I can just scoop up tons of fish. It's really crazy. Here's a picture of it probably. Anyways, Danish Norwegian author Eric Ponto Eric Pontopadan popularized the story of the Kraken in 1753, saying it was a multiple-armed creature according to the lore, but argued that it was either a giant sea crab or an octopus or possibly a starfish, which... Guys, a giant starfish would be so scary. Like, if you don't know the backside of a starfish, the entire thing is literally its mouth. They just, they bore stuff, dude. It's crazy. Anyways, the descriptions of the Kraken began to become more like an octopus or a squid that were just absolutely massive. Now, while a lot of people regarded it as just a sheer monster, there was a French zoologist back in the late 1700s, early 1800s, named Denise Montfort, who is known for pioneering the idea that the giant octopus did exist and that the Kraken really was was just an animal. Montfort published this article back in 1801 with this very famous image of a kraken attacking a ship, deeming it to be the largest organism in the entire world. That's such an epic picture. He later had more of a controversial claim where he proposed that 10 British warships that had previously mysteriously just disappeared one night in 1782 must have been attacked and sunk by a giant octopus or octopuses. Oct octopi. However, the British actually knew what had happened to their ships, resulting in Montfort having his career ruined, and then he ended up dying of starvation in Paris in 1820, so I don't know why I included that. But the legends of these great man-killing octopus entered into French culture kind of because of this in the form of books, which this led to a very famous depiction of the Kraken in Jules Verne's you know, that author who did the books like Around the World in 80 Days, Journey to the Center of the Earth. In his famous book, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, where their submarine is attacked by a school of giant squid and one of his crew members is actually captured. It's a great story. If you guys have like Disney+, Plus, the 1954 movie adaptation of 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea is freaking epic. You should watch it. It's actually so... Isn't it good? Yeah. Yeah, my wife liked it too, so... Yeah! She's being held hostage. So anyways, the legend of the Kraken may have originated from early sightings of giant squid, which giant squid can grow between 40 and 50 feet long. I mean, it's just, it's, this is where it gets so crazy. So here's a scale of like the giant squid, the colossal squid. What's so interesting is there's this colossal squid, which it's still argued about what size it actually is because we don't really know exactly how big it is. We know for sure its body gets larger, but it's still like argued how long its tentacles are. But it's estimated to be roughly 46 feet long and weigh up to 1,000 pounds is the biggest one that's been captured. But just wait for this. What's crazy is that the colossal squid that's bigger, arguably bigger than the giant squid has never been seen in its natural habitat. If that's not crazy, then you, you are. And only eight adult colossal squid have ever been seen. I'm talking about dead or captured when they come up to the surface, which is not their habitat. Which many people believe that these eight adults that were captured weren't actually full grown too, so we really don't know what size they are. So they might be massive. Six of those eight colossal squid that we captured were just remains discovered in the stomachs of whales, which keep in mind, we only find them in sperm whale stomachs because those are the only natural predator of the giant or the colossal squids. Which, like, sperm whales, like, they've seen things we cannot imagine. Like, we find scratches on them because they have fights with the giant and the colossal squid. And they have to dive so extremely deep that, like, no joke, they will get the bends sometimes when they come up so fast and their blood will boil and they'll die. It's crazy. And you might be asking yourself, if old sailors or pirates and stuff back in the day were getting attacked by giant or colossal squids, then why aren't they doing it now? Well, there's this theory called vertical migration. And the idea basically suggests that sea monsters mentioned throughout all of history are actually real. And the reason we don't see them is because they literally migrate vertically or they plunge deeper into the depths of the ocean. Because as more traffic crosses over the ocean, giant sea creatures like hypothetical the bloop or the kraken or other like sea serpent things just go deeper. And because they just go deeper, we're just highly unlikely to see something that's that deep due to the darkness and the pressure and all that. Which we actually do see squids do this whenever there's like increased traffic over an area, they just go deeper. So why wouldn't the giant ones too? Now, if you're questioning if a giant squid would attack people or like pose a threat to ships historically 
absolutely they would. So while squids we've officially found wouldn't be a threat to like the large modern boats or cruise ships, smaller ships or boats have occasionally been attacked by giant squids. And like one of the reasons there's very few attacks by squids on boats is just because they don't come to the surface almost ever. It's just like a rare thing they do, which is probably good because I mean they would be a huge danger. Reliable witness reports of giant squids attacking ships in recent times, even larger ships have actually happened. Some even swimming at 25 miles per hour, which is insane for an aquatic animal, which we still don't know, keep in mind how fast they move. From these attacks, we can assume that a lot of these squids were seeing these ships on the surface and they think the bottom side of them are fish, so they go up and try to eat them and they bite where they think the fish's heads are, and that's how we figured out that they think they're fish, is because they're biting where they think the brains are which means they're trying to take down massive fish, which is crazy in itself. And let me tell you, I'm just going to go ahead and read some of the most crazy, notable instances of squids attacking boats or people. In 1782, during the American Revolutionary War, there was this incident where this French ship, Villa de Paris, was said to have been attacked by a huge squid. It was said to have been dragged deep into the ocean, however, others claim that it just sunk during a storm in 1782, so... So in 1941, these survivors from a shipwreck in the South Atlantic Ocean, the Britannia, they got into a raft where they were then attacked by a giant squid. One of the men was dragged away from the raft by a squid, and another, Lieutenant Raymond Cox, managed to narrowly escape the same fate, but suffered tentacle sucker wounds. Years later, Cox's wounds from the squid were examined by the Burbeck College, where they validated the story, assuring that the marks of one and a quarter inches in size belong to a 23 foot long squid. That's crazy. This story has been called the only authentic report of a giant squid killing a human. So in 1978, allegedly this ship called Ulysses was attacked by a giant squid. This took place off the Galapagos Islands in the Pacific Ocean and for decades, stories of this attack has been historically really famous. It's one of the most well known documented cases of a squid that's giant attacking a ship giant squid. According to the story, a group of sailors spotted this squid in the water and they attempted to harpoon it. In response, the giant squid chased after the boat and actually lashed out and latched onto the boat temporarily with its tentacles and launched just an absolute vicious attack. The crew was forced to fire at the creature, making it retreat, and the aftermath recorded was that the squid caused significant damage to the ship, including smashing several windows, bending several handrails, and also doing minor damage to the hull of the ship. So that thing must have been huge. 2003. In a more recent one, this giant squid attacked a racing yacht called Geronimo. These guys were racing this yacht across the world, and they got into the mid-Atlantic, which keep in mind is close to where the legend of the Kraken was told. They said when they got there, they were hit with several vibrations, and when the crew went below deck to see what was wrong, they saw tentacles moving. They said the squid was pulling really hard on their boat so they had to stop and they got all ready to fight it. They got hooks and knives, but as soon as they slowed down the boat, it just jumped off. So it's really amazing that a highly elusive sea creature with only 250 sightings, most of them dead on the beaches, had ended up clinging to the side of a moving boat. That's just insane. And there was also this very recent thing where this diver got attacked by like two or three Humboldt squids and he got his shoulder dislocated and he like broke his wrist in several spots and they almost killed him. Which is like, these squids are so strong. He also said that this, the Humboldt squids pulled him down so fast it blew his eardrum. So yeah, I would say the Legend of the Kraken is very valid. I think it'd be really silly to say that there's not larger squids deeper because I mean we just we haven't explored enough we just don't know enough about the ocean and considering 80% of the ocean is unexplored and 90% of the species haven't been discovered yet I would say there's bigger squid. Kraken's out there. Team Kraken. Moving on to Russia. Baba Yaga. If you ever see a house walking around in the middle of the woods you probably shouldn't go close to it. I did a video where I like introed it like that it was kind of so the legend of Baba Yaga is about this witch woman from Slavic folklore. Her name kind of means grandmother witch, uh, but it's argued about what the Yaga actually means. Some say she's the guide to the afterlife, while other people say she lives in the borders between worlds, between the living and the dead, and somewhere in the 33rd kingdom, whatever that means. Others say she's the devil's grandmother, which means she probably had children, and I don't know how that lineage works. She's the grandmother to the devil the kids and then the kids had the devil so who's the kids 
Never mind. Some say she's just a witch trickster who causes mayhem. Baba Yaga is said to live in a magical hut in the forest that stands on two giant chicken legs. The wooden hut she lives in usually has no windows and sometimes not even doors, but the house does reveal doors whenever you tell it a magical phrase. You might ask yourself, where did this legend come from? Why do people think there's a house walking around on two legs? Well, back in the day, Slavic people used to have this house called the House of Death where they would have these little houses that they like to bury their dead in. And these little houses were placed high on hills and they had like these little pillars that came off of them and they kind of looked like chicken legs. So that's probably where the legend of the chicken house comes from. It's also said that the fence surrounding Baba Yaga's hut is made of human bones with skulls on top of them, often with one pole lacking a skull, which means that there's space for another one. In Russia, Tales of Baba Yaga says that she is able to move so quick through the woods by using a mortar and pestle to fly around. Which a mortar and pestle is something you use to like make potions or cook or crush people bones. She said to use this mortar to fly through the air and then she sweeps her tracks away with a silver broom as she goes. And she either does three things to people who comes to her woods. Helps them, imprisons them, or eats them. Especially if you're a child. The reason people think this idea of Baba Yaga eating children came from is basically because in ancient times there was this ritual called baking. And baking was a thing where they would take children who had rickets and they tried to cure rickets, which rickets was just like a vitamin D deficiency. They would take a child, wrap them up in dough, and then put them on a shovel and place them into a hot oven three times. And then the child was unwrapped from the dough and then the dough was fed to the dogs. Not the child, the child was fine after that. They thought this helped and most likely this became a negative thing after Christianity began to be introduced and they wanted to rid the area of pagan rituals. So they're like, your grandma's gonna eat you don't let her do the pagan ritual, which is a pretty base thing to do. Anyways, Baba Yaga is said to probably be the most famous figure from Slavic folklore. She's said to be the guardian of the fountains of the waters of life, which I believe, according to mythology, the waters of life is supposed to be basically something that can resurrect the dead, according to mythology. In the stories of Baba Yaga, she's usually like a villain um, in pretty much all the stories. But people forget that she can offer assistance sometimes. She's understood to be more of a trickster character who encourages positive transformation in people rather than just being like downright evil. There's stories where she kidnaps children and threatens to eat them because they're bad. And stories where she provides misleading information to strangers who were unlucky enough to stumble in her forest and become lost. But some stories say people seek her out for her wisdom and occasionally she's been known to offer guidance. And this is usually people that are like lost souls who need help with their quests. Uh, but yeah, this is really rare for her to actually help people in her stories. Baba Yaga is probably best known for the story of Vasilisa the Beautiful. Basically, it's a Russian fairy tale about this beautiful girl who lives with her father and her evil stepmother and stepsisters. Extremely similar to Cinderella. It's almost identical. Except there's an evil witch and a lot of threats of death. Probably more magic. Anyways, the stepsisters are really mean to her and one day they send her to Baba Yaga's hut one night to fetch a lantern to light their house for some reason. She goes to Baba Yaga's house and Baba Yaga makes her do impossible tasks with the threat that she would be killed if she didn't succeed. But when she miraculously succeeds, Baba Yaga sends her home with a lantern made from a human skull. And she finds her family unable to light any candles in her house for the past few days. But with her new lantern, she's able to do it. And the story goes that Vasilisa lives happily ever after and marries the Tsar or the Emperor of Russia. There's also another variant of the story where her evil stepmother and stepsisters just die. She just goes home and they're just dead. So, that's nice. But yeah, anyways, Baba Yaga, it's like a boogeyman creature, kind of threatens kids to be good. So watch out for chicken houses. Moving on to the United Kingdom, the Loch Ness Monster. The Loch Ness Monster may be the most famous monster myth in the entire world, unless it's the Yeti or Bigfoot, I'm not for sure. Also called Nessie, the Loch Ness Monster is a creature in Scottish folklore that is said to inhabit the Loch Ness, which is this large freshwater lake in the highland areas of Scotland. It's often described as having a small head, long neck, thick body, and seal-like flippers and a long tail. Basically no difference between it and a plesiosaur. Now before we get into the story of our beloved Nessie, you need to know that water-dwelling monsters have long been talked about throughout Scottish folklore. Among the Scottish folklore, there's things like shape-shifting water horses called the Kelpie, the nine-eyed eel thing. There's even like a shape-shifting seal that's basically just like a normal seal 
but it can peel back its skin and then it's like a beautiful woman mermaid thing. So anyways, the legend of more of the Loch Ness Monster is extremely old and goes all the way back to the 6th century in 565 AD when the earliest report of the monster happened. St. Columba. So according to the story, there was this Irish monk called St. Columba and he was staying next to the Loch Ness in the land of the Picts. One day he came upon some men who were trying to bury a guy next to the River Ness, which it's the river that flows into the Loch Ness Lake. When St. St. Columba asked the men how the guy they were burying had died, they explained that he had been killed by a giant water beast. They said that the man was swimming in the river when he was suddenly attacked by a water beast that mauled him and dragged him under, and despite their attempts from their boat to rescue him, they could not save him. So St. Columba sent one of his followers, Long Ni Muka Min, to swim across the river I guess to test and see if there really was a water beast or to try to perform some sort of miracle. And the beast came up to the surface and started to approach St. Columba's man to attack him. But St. Columba, being the saint he was, made the sign of the cross and said, Go no further. Do not touch the man. Get back at once. And the creature stopped in its tracks as if it had been pulled back with ropes and fled. And Columba's man and the Picts gave him thanks for what they perceived as a miracle. So that's the first story. It's also worth noting that water beast stories were extremely common in medieval texts all around. It's also worth noting that this story about St. Columba was written 100 years later by another guy after St. Columba's death. So... Yeah. There's a few other accounts. The more recent report started in 1871. A guy named D. McKenzie reported seeing something that looked like a log or an upturned boat start wriggling and churning up the water. Then in 1888, a guy named Alexander McDonald sighted a large, stubby-legged animal surfacing and getting 50 yards from him, saying it looked like a salamander. Then in 1933, an article was published in the paper that first attracted huge attention to this creature. This was about a woman who said she saw a huge whale-like fish beast thing wallowing all around in the water and it looked really odd. But the incident that caused the most modern interest in the current day is that of George Spicer. On July 22, 1933, George Spicer and his wife were said to have seen the most extraordinary form of animal to ever cross the road in front of their car. They described the creature as having a large body about 4 feet high, 25 feet long, having a long wavy neck slightly thicker than an elephant's trunk, and being as long as the width of the road, which was about 10 feet. They said they saw no limbs, but it lurched across the road towards the lock, leaving a broken trail of brush as it went. Spicer said it was the nearest approach to a dragon or prehistoric animal he had ever seen in his life. You know, that's that's probably a good thing. And as it having a long neck which moved up and down in the matter of a scenic railway. He said that it had an animal in its mouth, and that if it had any feet, it must have been web-like. It's worth noting that at this time, 1933 King Kong film had just came out and in this film there's a long necked dinosaur I think like a brontosaurus that rises out of the lake in the movie and then comes on land and eats a person so it's possible his sighting was just inspired by this dinosaur scene in King Kong. But anyways, the paper published this report and the monster triggered a massive amount of public interest. And then the uptick of alleged sightings led to the solidification of the name the Loch Ness Monster. So after this peak of interest, there was a insane amount of attention around the Loch Ness Monster. Businesses started putting the name Nessie in local products, and the official travel association had to go on record denying that they didn't invent the story to encourage tourism. And allegedly, in 1934, the first photo of the monster was taken. And this is the Sturgeon's photo. This picture was allegedly taken by Robert Wilson. I say allegedly because he didn't want to have his name associated with it. According to Wilson, he was looking at the lock when suddenly he saw a monster and he grabbed his camera and snapped four photos. Only two of the pictures came out clearly and the first photo is what's became the most famous photo of any water-based monster in the world. After this spurt of fame, the whole monster situation kind of died down for a while, and it wasn't until like 1951 when a new photograph appeared. This is the Lacan Stewart photograph, which looks to depict a three-humped depiction of Nessie sitting in the water, but almost immediately after, Lacan admitted it was a hoax that he had created with three bales of hay. And at this time in 1957, there was also this book that came out that was called More Than a Legend by Constance White. This book had a theory that basically went that the Loch Ness Monster was not just one single animal, 
but actually multiple animals that inhabit the lake. And that these creatures were probably plesiosaurs that were frozen in a glacier in the Loch Ness, but slowly thawed out after the Ice Age and became adapted to the fresh water there in the Loch Ness. It's a pretty interesting theory, I say why not. Later in 1975, this guy named Ian Weatherwell, who was the son of the guy who took the very famous Sturgeon's photo, came out claiming that his father had faked the picture. Basically, Ian's father, Marmaduke Weatherall, was a journalist employed by Daily Mail and was on a journalistic mission to investigate the monster in the Lake Loch Ness. When Marmaduke was at the Loch Ness, he found some crazy looking footprints on the beach. And he was positive that these were Nessie footprints and he photographed them, but he sent the picture of the tracks to some zoologists and they were positive that they were just a taxidermy hippopotamus leg that had been stamped in the sand. And this outraged Marmaduke and out of vengeance, he created the Sturgeon's photograph. And the way the picture was faked was actually pretty clever. Basically, he took a toy submarine and he molded the head of Nessie on it with wood putty, which he actually had his son Ian Weatherwell do, who confessed to this. Then Marmaduke took the photograph and then he passed it on to a few other people, but it ended up in the hands of Robert Wilson, who gave it to the press. And maybe that's why Robert didn't want his name associated with it. He called it the surgeon's photo because he kind of questioned the validity. So recently, my dad sent me this article and the headline of the article says, thousands set to gather to hunt for the Loch Ness Monster. And basically the article goes on to say that the largest Loch Ness Monster search effort is happening like right now. Witnesses across the globe, both in person and online, are coordinating in order to find the Loch Ness Monster. It's going to be the most comprehensive search of the surface ever. Volunteers will scan the waters for any disturbances or enigmatic movement that might hint for the elusive creature's presence beneath the surface. Now organized by the Loch Ness Center, the expedition is aimed to unravel the mystery. Anyways, to this day, there are still 10 unexplained creature sightings that happen every year in the Loch Ness. Moving on to France, the werewolf. So this one's really crazy. I'm sure a lot of you guys know about the Salem Witch Trials, but do you know about the France werewolf trials. Which, if you don't know the Salem witch trials, it was a literal witch hunt that took place back in the 1600s where 200 people were accused of performing witchcraft and 19 people were actually executed. It's also known as the greatest case of mass hysteria ever. But the France werewolf trials happened even before the witch trials in Salem even happened. So werewolves historically have not always been seen as like out of control man-eating beasts. Back in the day they were seen as being just more like regular human beings that were cursed to take the form of wolves while maintaining the mind of a regular person. In the Middle Ages in Europe, the legend of werewolves really took off. While there are many different versions of the folklore, most stories agreed that while the people that were werewolves were in animal form, they looked basically just like a normal wolf. They'd roam the forest of Europe, howling through the night, except that they didn't have tails and they kept their human eyes and could speak with their normal human voices. Which I feel like that makes it even creepier than if they couldn't do any of that, so. It was also said that you could tell if a regular human while in human form was a werewolf based on some characteristics. Such as having heavy eyebrows that met in the middle like a unibrow, having lower ears on their head, and having strangely curved fingernails and walking with a limp. It's also said if you looked underneath their tongue, they would have hair there. So whenever Christianity began to spread throughout Europe, Werewolves gradually began to be associated with things like witchcraft and the devil. People back then were very scared of being attacked or turned into a werewolf, and the Middle Ages were a very superstitious time. Basically, if you strayed from the beliefs of the Catholic Church at all, you'd be left exposed to being preyed on by tons of different demon things, including werewolves. But the way you could be transformed to a werewolf ranged from anywhere between being cursed, to having your clothes stripped off and putting on a belt made with wolf skin, or even just having a magic ointment rubbed on your body. There was also belief that if you slept outside in the open on a particular night in the summer, during a full moon, you could sometimes become a werewolf too, so. And also, to kill or cure a werewolf had different ways to do that. You could either physically exhaust someone, take an herb called wolfsbane, or you could physically perform an exorcism with a lot of prayers and sometimes forms of surgery. These anti-werewolf surgeries consisted of driving nails through people's hands and feet, or having a knife 
driven into their forehead. So the silver bullet thing was just kind of invented later on as a part of modern fiction. One of the earliest known werewolf trials was the case of a shepherd named Pierre Bergat. Around 1521 in France, Bergat claimed he encountered three horsemen dressed in black. One of the men told Bergat that in exchange for obeying him, he would be given money and have his sheep herd protected. Bergat was like, oh yeah, he agreed with this, but then the next time he met the horseman, he tried to force him to denounce God, the Holy Virgin, the company of heaven, and baptism. And Bergat understandably didn't want to do this, but one of his friends, a fellow shepherd, convinced Bergat to come with him to a meeting of warlocks, or wizards. That's, that's a typical fellow shepherd friend move, though. Which, keep in mind, this was written by a French historian who really believed this was real way back in the day, so... At this meeting, his friend rubbed magic ointment all over him and suddenly his limbs began to sprout hairs and his hands turned into paws. His friend also put ointment on himself and turned into a werewolf as well. From that night forward, the two men went on committing multiple murders while transformed as werewolves. Until one day, they were accused of eating a four-year-old girl. Under interrogation, the shepherd Brigo his friend went on to reveal the name of a third werewolf, and after being captured, all three men were executed for their crimes. So you can see how these trials kind of get out of control. One person accuses another person, and that person gets interrogated and forced to tell about another person. And then suddenly, you know, you and the boys are hanging because you were werewolves and you were massacring people. I feel like there's also borderline, like, a deeper meaning to this story. Like, the Shepherd Brigo. These three horsemen rode up. They're like, hey, renounce God. He was like, I don't want to do that. But then he went to this meeting where he did an evil act and became evil and did evil things. And then there was three of them. So it's like he became like the three horsemen because there was three werewolves. So basically he became the evil that he didn't want to be, but he kind of chose to do it. So later on in 1603, a 14-year-old named Jean Grenier was arrested and would soon confess to being a werewolf. Here we go, this is where the werewolf trials really start. He claimed the responsibility of murdering several missing children, including a baby. Sean had been reported to authorities by a 13-year-old girl who said that Sean had boasted about killing people while in the form of a wolf. So Sean went on to tell authorities that a while ago, he had met an entity called the Lord of the Forest, and that the Lord of the Forest had gifted him a wolf skin and mysterious ointment, which when he combined would give him the ability to transform into a wolf. So... Depending on the source, Sean was believed to either just be possessed by a demon or be suffering from a mental illness, or maybe he was just a silly little boy making stuff up. Regardless, he was sentenced to live out the rest of his life in a monastery in Bordeaux. Which, you know what, I'm okay with that. It's better than being hung or tied to a chair and then thrown into the river to see if you actually can swim. While in Bordeaux, some sources claim that Sean still believed he was a werewolf and would often walk around on all fours because he thought he was a wolf and also he claimed he was visited once again by the lord of the forest who had promised him that he would be freed from the monastery also during this time there was like for some reason a dog man creature said to be sighted close to this area so maybe it was him kind of difficult to tell what's real or fake from all these sources but everyone agrees that sean greenier died at the monastery in 1610 so he lived out a full 1600s life of 24 -ish years so hearing this story you might assume that this was like an isolated case but it wasn't at all and this this type of thing kind of started to spread many similar events began occurring around france during this time that became known as the french werewolf epidemic between 1520 and 1630, there was over 30,000 reported cases of werewolves. One of the most famous cases, not in France though, was of a German farmer in 1598. Peter Stump was his name, and he was accused of using witchcraft to turn himself into a wolf and go on a killing spree, which led to the death of two pregnant women and 14 children. And also, he ate all his victims, so. Peter was then interrogated by being stretched out on this torture device called the rack that, like, stretched out all your limbs and dislocated all your joints, until he admitted to all the accusations and even went as far as to admitting that he had been practicing magic since he was 12 years old. He claimed that he turned into a werewolf after the devil himself 
gave him a magic belt that turned him into a wolf. And he was then executed in a very brutal manner. He was skinned alive and then beheaded. But the legends of the werewolf didn't stop just there in France or even in Europe. So a large amount of French settlers traveled from France to Europe and then all the way into Canada. And this caused massive killings of wolves in Canada and later on started a new legend. So a lot of French people living in Canada the French Canadians, they all migrated down into the U.S. and had this huge concentration in Louisiana, mainly New Orleans, as you guys know. And from this area in Louisiana came the story of the Loop Guru, which literally just means werewolf in French. And the legend was kind of silly. It was basically like people who were bad Catholics would become a Loop Guru. For example, if you didn't confess during Easter, yep. You're, you're a werewolf now. And according to them, the curse would last 101 days and you would change every single night. You'd be forced to wander the countryside in animal form. However, the spell could be broken if someone recognized you while you were in wolf form. I recently heard this really interesting theory that both the Salem Witch Trials and the French Werewolf Trials were mainly caused by ergot poisoning. Which, if you don't know, ergot poisoning is when a person consumes this fungus that sometimes grow in grains like rye or wheat. And this fungus produces toxic alkaloids, and these alkaloids can cause people to have severe hallucinations, confusion, convulsions, and even death. Here's an article. Many historians believe that ergot infestation in Massachusetts caused strange activities among some women in 1691 and eventually led to the Salem witch hunts. And it would make sense because, like, if you accidentally got that into your food and a bunch of people just suddenly died and they were just tripping and they thought they were seeing all kinds of stuff, you'd probably be like, yeah, there is witches here. There's some demonic stuff going on. I think I would think that too because it's like... You wouldn't be able to detect it, I feel like. Anyways, why did France have such a weird obsession with wolves and wolf people things? Well, to be honest, it was probably because they were afraid. In France, they've always had this struggle with, like, wolves in the rural areas. Which probably the best example of the struggle of wolves in France is the Beast of Gévaudan. The Beast of Gévaudan is known as a man-eating animal that terrorized a small farming village in France called Gévaudan in 1764. And this beast was known for killing as many as 100 people. The beast was said to have attacked 210 people and roughly 100 people died. It was described a few different ways as looking like a hyena or a wolf dog or like a big cat. Which is totally possible that it was like a mountain lion or something. Or maybe it was like multiple wolves or whatever. But what's crazy is the captain of the local army was assigned to kill this monstrous wolf thing. After several attempts failed, he ended up getting 20,000 men to go out and find the beast. But that happened like during a really brutal winter so they weren't able to find it. And so the attacks got so bad that the king of France actually sent his royal gun bearer and hunting expert to go out and kill the beast. After so many failed attempts, the locals decided to take matters into their own hands because even the royal gun bearer couldn't kill it. And 300 locals got together and went out to kill it. And an unlikely peasant and innkeeper, Jean Chastel, ended up killing the monster and became a hero to those who it terrorized. But what's funny is the stories kind of got exaggerated. They told like Jean Chastel used a silver bullet to kill this giant wolf thing. And that led to like the modern day legend of werewolves needing silver to kill them. So yeah guys, if you ever feel like a witch is like hunting you or stalking you, um, don't hang your neighbor. They probably didn't do it you probably just had bad wheat but you never know moving on to greece and italy oh my gosh the cyclops so in this series i really wanted to talk about like giants and stuff like it and so for this one we're gonna be talking about a very famous type of giant the cyclops disclaimer i went down like a crazy rabbit hole on this one you'll see in just a second the cyclops is most famously known from the book homer's the odyssey which if you don't know the odyssey what are you doing it's about this king, Odysseus, who went off to fight in the Trojan War, but then he lost his way on his back from the war in the Mediterranean Sea and just, like, wandered around for, like, ten years fighting all kinds of monsters and sirens and sea monsters and... But no, most notably, Cyclopses. So in the story, Odysseus and his men land on the island of the Cyclopses just off the coast of Sicily. And when they got there, they realized the Cyclopses were just these giant men-like creatures that had one eye in the middle of their forehead and were the children of Poseidon. 
They were described in this story as being uncivilized shepherds who lived in caves and had no knowledge of agriculture and were unable to craft ships, so they never left the island. And they basically lived apart from the rest of the world in a place lacking laws. Odysseus and his men came across a cave full of food and supplies while on this island, and as they were very hungry and needed supplies really bad, they decided to go in and start eating. But what they didn't know is that a cyclops, Polyphemus, was just about to return home with his sheep, and that this was his cave and his home. So the cyclops entered the cave and sealed the doors with a huge boulder, and then he realized that his cave was full of humans. So the Cyclops immediately grabbed two men and just smashed them on the ground and started eating them raw. And the other men just stood there and stared because it's like they couldn't even compete with this dude. And the Cyclops apparently wasn't even concerned with the other humans in his cave. He just went to sleep. And while he was sleeping, Odysseus was like, I gotta do something. And he and his men sharpened this great big wooden pole. And then he tricked the Cyclops the next day to drink too much wine with him and he told the Cyclops that his name was No Man. No Man. And that night after the Cyclops went to sleep Odysseus got his giant pole that's spiky super hot and then stabbed it into the Cyclops' eye blinding him. And he started screaming. He was like No Man hurt me. No Man stabbed me. I'm blind. And the other Cyclopses outside the cave were like Why'd you do this to yourself, man? And then the next day, Odysseus and his men tied themselves to the belly of sheep and escaped the cave because the Cyclops was blind and he was taking the sheep out to graze. And then as they were sailing away, the Cyclops that was blind threw rocks at him as Odysseus taunted him. There's also another famous Cyclops tale about the Hesiodic, which to summarize is basically three Cyclopses. Brontes, Seropus, and Argies, which were the sons of Uranus and Gaia. And these brothers could forge extremely powerful things, like they forged Zeus's thunderbolt, and they created Poseidon's trident, and they even made Hades' helm of invisibility, which is his, like, super powerful thing he has that... I actually didn't know about in history until I just started reading about it. So while I was researching this, I stumbled upon this crazy conspiracy theory about how the Cyclopses were like almost a metaphor for this advanced civilization that fell. Or maybe they were literally an advanced civilization that existed and then fell and then now they're on that island. So there seems to be like a theme going on about the number three. There's three brothers who forged the three legendary weapons, and it's also said that Cyclopses were responsible for building three of the biggest walls in ancient Greece. According to the ancient Greeks, they thought they built these walls because they were super old and they had no idea who built them. These walls were said to be the Mycenae, the Tyrans, and the Argos walls. And this idea is called Cyclopsian masonry. Cyclopsian masonry is basically like stone ruins from ancient structures that were so huge that the Greeks only thought that a giant person or like a cyclops could have built them. The most famous example of Cyclopsian masonry are found in the walls of Mycenae and the Tyrans. And the walls are made up of like these huge boulders. They appear to be like completely impossible for regular humans to have built them. And they were built so long ago. Like the ancient Greeks, they had no idea who built them. And it's also said that Protosthe, this magical king of ancient Argos, was said to have brought seven Cyclopses with him to build the walls of Tyrans. But I went so far down the rabbit hole on this one. Like, I haven't even gotten to the conspiracy yet. But just let me get into it real quick. It's insane. It's, it's really crazy. So, the Cyclopses were said to be the brother of the Titans in Greek mythology. And they were just straight up giants, and people like to compare the Titans to things like the Nephilim, or the fallen angel giants of the Old Testament in the Bible. And some people like to say that Cyclopses were basically a metaphor, or they actually were, a super advanced race of people maybe giants with one eye, that knew how to build better than anyone else did ever and that they crafted some of the most legendary weapons for people and built insane structures like those walls or maybe even other structures on earth like the pyramids. Some even go as far as to say that the Cyclopses were responsible for building the Tower of Babel, you know, that biblical story about the people trying to build a tower to heaven but then God was like, you can't do that. Boom, you have all different languages. Uh, but then when they were cast out of there because of their attempt to do this, they forgot their history and became a lost group of giants living on an island in the Mediterranean and that the Odyssey story is true and Odysseus actually found Cyclopses on a forgotten island and they had forgotten their past and were placed there as punishment. 
that they had tried to build that tower. I also noticed something very strange when I was watching the show Ancient Apocalypse. This structure Graham Hancock was convinced was built by like an advanced civilization was on this tiny island in the Mediterranean. And basically, he argued that this civilization either had to, one, be connected to the mainland because it was on an island, and if it was connected to the mainland, then the water would have been much lower, so it would have been pre-Ice Age era when it was built. So it would have been like the oldest structure ever. Or the second option is that this place was a super advanced civilization who knew how to build stuff way more advanced than anywhere else in the world, even while people didn't know how to do agriculture yet. Which, if a society wants to be able to do something really big, they need agriculture. They just do. Either they were advanced or they were super old. And what's interesting is that this structure, Gigantia, which is what it's called, is pretty darn close to one of those islands that the Cyclopses were said to have built the walls on from ancient Greece. And here's a picture of it. I took a picture on Google Earth somewhere. It's all really crazy and interesting, so, you know, keep an open mind. Do your own research because it's a lot of speculation. It's probably not real, but, you know, it's worth looking into. But if you really want to know, like, a lot of people think that the myth of the Cyclops is widely believed to have come from elephants. So, at one point in time, elephants and mammoths were said to roam the Mediterranean, like, in that area when the water was low, with several different species living side by side. And at the end of the Ice Age, the sea levels rose, suddenly destroying land bridges. This led to elephants evolving really fast because, like, whenever animals get on an island, they get secluded, and then they change really quickly. And this created these tiny, one meter tall, three foot tall, elephant mammoth things. And this led to a lot of skulls looking like they had a massive hole in their forehead area and looked kind of like a human skull. This is what it looked like. And I mean, really, that if I found that and I was an ancient Greek man, I'd be like, hmm, that is a giant. And it definitely has one eye. Because, like, if you saw that, there's you wouldn't be like, that's a navel cav cavity. No, I'd be like, that's an eye. That's an eye right there. All right, enough of all that nonsense. Let's move on to Germany, the Alp. This is definitely not nonsense at all. So, in German folklore, there is this supernatural being known as the Alp. So, there's this really famous painting that depicts an Alp called Nachtmare, which just means nightmare in German, I think. And it was painted in 1802. Which, it's like this Alp sitting on a sleeper's chest with a Mara, or mare, staring in the background. Which, a mare is also an evil entity horse thing too. Which, I think it's just supposed to represent, like, dreams or nightmares, or supposed to be like an incubus, which is like a demon that kisses women. Honestly, I couldn't, I mean, I don't think anybody knows for sure what the painting means, but it has an Alp in it, and it's pretty freaky looking, and it's super popular. It's a pretty painting. The name Alp translates to elf, but an Alp is not what you think an elf is. An Alp is a nightmare monster, or like a sleep paralysis demon, except it actually is a physical being according to mythology. Its primary victims are women, and they only attack at night by transforming their victims' dreams into horrible nightmares. And it does this so it can feast on the fears of those people. So the Alp will go into people's homes, sit on their chest, and make it harder for them to breathe, and then take their fear and eat it. It's said to be able to shapeshift into different things so it can walk among humans, usually taking the form of some kind of animal. And it's said that if you feel like a bird is like spying on you during the day, then it's probably an Alp because that's like one of their favorite things to do. They like to spy on you and like learn your ins and outs of your psychology to make it easier to twist your dreams into something scarier for you. It's also said that a lot of the Alps power is said to come from a magical hat that they wear called a Tarnkapi. So I'm sure many of you have heard of the Hat Man, which if you haven't, it's like this shadowy figure that's always seen wearing a hat and it's like a worldwide phenomenon. Uh, that people see during sleep paralysis. The Hat Man acts like a ghost, usually seen to just be standing in your room. It's said to basically just stand there and stare at you, and then it'll eventually just kind of fade out until you can't see it anymore. And it also is said to have no apparent reaction to people, like some people say they've like bumped into the Hat Man before, and he just stands there and he doesn't do anything for seconds or even minutes afterwards. And then it will move around just for a second and then just kind of vanish as if it 
couldn't even tell who was there or couldn't see anybody there. Paranormal researchers believe that the Hatman entity just studies and observes people, unlike the Alp, which causes nightmares and makes it hard for you to breathe. But back to the Alp. It's said that the Alp's hat is given to them as a birthright in a place beyond space-time by an unknown force. Sounds like a demon to me. The hat is said to give it the power to be invisible and do kind of a silly thing. If it transforms into an animal, it will still be wearing a tiny little hat. So if you see like a snake or a mouse wearing a hat, it's probably a probably an alp. If an alp loses its hat, it will go to great lengths to retrieve it. And if a human finds it, it's good luck because the alp will give you a reward. And it's not like a tricky reward like probably pretty much every folklore or other folklore would say, but the alp actually gives you an honest reward if you give it back its hat. Which this is probably the only positive interaction you can have with an alp. It's said that alps are known for cursing humans with their evil eye, which can range from illness to misfortune, but you can stop this curse by damaging its eye. The alp is often connected with witchcraft, even sometimes being said to possess vampire-like traits, sometimes sticking its long tongue down someone's throat to feed or even suck blood out of someone's nipples. But it's also said to have a thirst for breast milk, so I didn't make the lore. To defeat an alp, you actually can't, but there's a few things you can do to kind of keep it away. It's really weird. You can like put your shoes at the foot of your bed and face the laces towards you. You can just keep a light on at night. You can place an iron horseshoe on your bedpost, or you can get into bed backwards. I don't really... I don't really know why any of these would help. But it's also said that you can stuff a lemon in the mouth of an alp and it will temporarily immobilize it, but otherwise it's invincible. That's the lore, guys. My wife just complained that I was explaining it. All right, Ireland, the Banshee. So a Banshee is one of the oldest legends of Ireland. It's strongly associated with shamrocks and potatoes for some reason. It's said to be a female spirit that you can hear screaming out in the middle of rural areas at night around the Irish countryside. They're described as looking like a rather ugly elderly woman dressed in white or gray and having long silver or black hair and even occasionally taking the form of a crow or a weasel which is classic animals associated with witchcraft in Ireland. Now, according to the legend, banshees are known for warning members of Irish family of their impending death. Her presence alone brings no harm or evil, but if you hear a banshee screaming or keening, it means that someone you love is about to die. Now, it's said that banshees never appear to the ones that are going to die, but just appear to their loved ones. So, in the past, it was said that banshees were always seen washing human heads or limbs in order to dye their clothing red with blood for some reason. However, over the centuries, it's changed to being seen as more of like this woman walking around and lurking in the wilderness and crying loudly, sometimes called the Lady of Death or even the Woman of Peace. Now, banshees won't cry for just anyone. According to the legend, each banshee mourns of members of the family of one of the five oldest families in Ireland, and they each have their own banshee. These families are the O'Neills, the O'Briens, the O'Grady's, the O'Connors, and the Cavanaugh's. So basically, the banshee is a solitary fairy creature who loves the families that she's connected with. She loves it so much that she will pace the hills in sorrow when she knows a death is looming. Uh, but if you don't live in Ireland, you can't escape it. So if you're just of Irish blood, she will follow your family members across the world. Her keening or wailing can be heard wherever true Irish people live. Because like many Irish, she never forgets her blood ties. It's said that without being seen, she will attend their funerals and her wails will mix in with other mourners without others knowing. So famous tales of banshee sightings date back a long time. One of the first was in 1014 AD. It tells of a banshee attached to the kingly house of O'Brien who haunted the rock of Craglia. Legend has it that Abe Hill, the banshee, appeared to the old king Brian Burrow before the battle of Clontard, which was fought that same year. A story from the 1700s tell of a group of children who went on an evening walk and saw an old woman sitting on a rock beside the road. She began to wail and clap her hands, which is like the classic keening wail, and children ran away in fear, only later to discover that the old man who lived in the house behind the rock died that very moment. There's a bunch of other ones, probably too many to talk about. But what's really interesting is where the idea of the Wailing Woman came from. So way back in the day in Ireland, and also parts of Scotland too, there was this tradition of mourning called keening, where these women would basically be professional mourners. Which you may think doesn't sound too scary, right? 
Well, I watched a video of like traditional keening and it, it's actually pretty freaky. I tried to find a video to put in here, but I couldn't find it again. As a keening woman back in the day, your profession would be really in high demand if you were good at it. But it kind of made these women who did it become outsiders. Like oftentimes they wouldn't get paid very well. They might just get paid in alcohol. Some might become alcoholics because of this. And you can kind of see where the mystery and the lack of understanding of these women would come from. So yeah, anyways, if you're Irish, good luck. And if you're not, congrats. You won't have to deal with the screaming women unless you get married. But yeah, if you're Irish, if, if you're Irish, you might have to deal with it. Moving on to Spain, dragons. So dragons, believe it or not, are actually a worldwide phenomenon. Dragon stories have been around for thousands of years. Every major culture around the world has their own type of dragon story. Spain, China, Greece, even the middle of America, the Aztecs had legends about dragons. I heard this guy talking about this somewhere one time about how... I don't know where it came from or like what his name was or I would put it in the video but sorry man I'm gonna kind of paraphrase what you said and what he said was the existence of dragon stories around the world have three explanations which is one all societies were somehow connected on a much greater level than we had previously thought and that these ideas of these winged serpents or dragons was spread a long time ago two Dragons actually existed and they were living creatures and we had to deal with them and they were a terror on society and yeah, dragons were real. Or three, humans for some reason just are ingrained in our brains with the need to make up stories of dragons. We just needed to just tell this story and each and every one of us for some reason in every culture had to come up with a story of a dragon and... I don't know. I don't know about you guys, but I think either they existed or societies were connected on a greater scale. Now, although dragon legends have a similar creature in every story, the way dragons looked and were depicted differs through societies. In Spain, the legend of the dragon was almost always an evil giant winged serpent that usually lives in the caves and guards treasure and keeps these nymph-like creatures called Exana or Unjana which were like these female fairy things that were found near water or like pure water in the forests. There's this legend of a dragon in northern Spain that people used to claim could mesmerize people just by looking at you. So one day a young man decided to go out and kill the beast and what he did was take a shield and polish it until it was extremely shiny like a mirror and when the dragon looked at him it mesmerized its own reflection and the young man arriving at the cave where the dragon lived was able to kill the dragon super easily because it just locked up and couldn't move. This legend is really similar to the legend of Medusa. In other parts of the world, dragons look very differently. Like in China, the dragon was seen as more of like a wise symbol of strength and prosperity and good luck. And it like ran through the sky without wings. There's also the dragon myth of the Aztecs called Quetzalcoatl, which basically was this deity giant serpent thing with feathered wings that was said to be the one that brought wind and rain and was in control of agriculture and science and knowledge and a lot more and was one of those things that they sacrificed 250,000 people per year to. But look at this thing, this is Quetzalcoatlus. It's the biggest known petrosaur species that was found in North America. This thing's literally a dragon, guys. I don't know why people have to say that like dinosaurs aren't dragons because it's just like I don't see why not I mean they just they literally look exactly like dragons why don't we just say that we found a bunch of different types of dragons I mean I feel like that's more reasonable anyways yeah this thing was named Quetzalcoatlus after the name Quetzalcoatl um, which basically is the Aztec equivalent of a dragon so yeah I just wanted to let you know about that. Anyways, there's a lot of different dragon stories and I could go on forever, but I'm not going to. Poland. Moving on to Poland, Plague Maiden. As far as Slavic monsters go, Plague Maiden is probably the most terrifying. I'm not gonna talk too much about it, but it's said that before a plague arrived in a city, this creature would fly around at night in the form of a skinny woman or sometimes looking more of like a skeleton or bloody sheet thing. Sometimes for convenience, it would grab onto a person of the town passing by and sit on their shoulders, ordering that person to wander around the village and towns waving a red scarf or handkerchief, and bringing a massive amount of death and sheer torment to those in the villages. One fairy tale told about Plague Maiden or Plague Woman is about a woman who was outside of a small town who wouldn't dare enter it without someone's help because she's shunned by many people of the town, except for one man 
who she manages to convince to give her a ride into town using his cart. In return for his help, she remembers his house, and as she brings her plague all throughout the village killing tons of people, she remembers his house and his family, and they all survived due to his kindness. But was it really kindness if he just doomed the entire town to be killed and probably killed hundreds or thousands of people? That's kind of selfish. Maybe it was bound to happen. No, we're not gonna we're not gonna get into the philosophy of all that. Moving on to Denmark. Mermaids. The tales of mermaids date all the way back to the first written accounts of humanity, and throughout history there have been real historical figures who have claimed to encounter them, like I'll talk about later. So, a mermaid is said to be a mythical, sea-dwelling creature, often described as having the head and body of a woman, and having a fish's tail below the waist. Stories of these mermaids have been around for thousands of years and span cultures across the world, from the coasts of Ireland all the way to South Africa. Just like a few other huge monster myths like the dragon or the werewolf, the origins of mermaids are thought to have come all the way back from one of the first larger civilizations, Mesopotamia, where archaeologists have found accounts of mythology of Oenas, which is this male fish deity from 5,000 years ago. I ended up placing the mermaid in Denmark because of one of the most famous stories of mermaids, The Little Mermaid. It was actually published all the way back in 1837 as a collection of fairy tales. But there's a significant difference between the modern Disney version than the one made back in the 1800s. In the original story of the mermaid, the princess loses her tongue to obtain legs, and every time she walks, her pain is compared to walking on knives. And while Disney's story ended with the mermaid living happily ever after, the original had a much more tragic story. So according to the story, the little mermaid transformed into a human to gain a soul because in the story, mer people didn't have souls and she wanted to live forever. And if she could get the prince to fall in love with her, then her soul would merge with his and she could live forever too. But the princess fails to undo her curse of not being able to speak, and the prince marries someone else. So the little mermaid sisters come to her, like swim up to her in, when she was at the shore, and give her a dagger. And they're like, if you kill the prince, you can turn back into a mermaid. But instead of killing him, she ends up sacrificing herself and living with the spirits of the air, which are like these little fairy things that bring warm air from place to place on the earth, and yeah, it's all... It's all kind of weird. One of the other more sinister depictions of mermaids come from the story of Sirens. Now, the earlier version of Sirens was said to not be a mermaid at all, but more of a bird person thing that was like this giant bird body with a woman head. But in the most famous stories of Sirens, they're more of a mermaid looking creature and they all want to just kill you by singing them into their trap. In the Odyssey, when Odysseus and his crew encountered the Sirens, he instructed them to fill their ears with beeswax in order to not hear their beautiful song. Odysseus, being a rather eccentric guy, you know, wanted to hear the song and to know what it was like because it was said that no man had ever heard their song and lived. So he asked his crew to tie him to the mast of his ship and no matter what he said, if he begged to be released and on whatnot, they were not to let him go until they had passed well beyond the sirens. And apparently this did make Odysseus go insane. He was like, let me go, I gotta go to the sirens, but after a while he went back to normal. After they had passed by the sirens. Oh, well guess what guys, my audio cut out and I missed like 10 minutes of filming and also the outro, so I'm just gonna do it again. So there's another big thing in pop culture about the siren that I'm sure a lot of you have seen but you don't really realize you see it all the time, and that is Starbucks. So I'm not gonna get too far into it, but Starbucks logo is supposed to be a siren and why is that? Well, basically, when they were creating the logo for Starbucks, they wanted to find something that was as seductive as coffee. And the CEO, Howard Schultz, he went on to say how they looked all over the place, and they really wanted something as seductive as coffee itself. So yeah, Starbucks is supposed to be like irresistible, kind of like a siren, so just want to let you guys know that. But there's actually another really big mermaid figure that I didn't realize was like a popular mythology thing until I just learned about it. So if any of you guys have played Sea of Thieves and then you fall off your ship and then you're trying to get back on your ship and then a mermaid's out there and you have to swim up to him to respawn onto your boat, that guy's actually from mythology. There's this guy named Glaucus who was a fisherman who discovered a magical herb that could bring fish back to life. And he was really curious about what would happen if a human ate it. And guess what he did? He ate it and the dude turned into a merman. Gaucus's legs turned into a fishtail and became overwhelmed with the desire to live in the sea. Based. Now, Gaucus was considered immortal, but was struggling with his new gift to 
want to live in the sea. But then the other deities of the sea taught him their secrets and even the art of prophecy. So from then on until now, Gaucus appears to people who get lost at sea in order to guide them to safety just like in Sea of Thieves. That's pretty epic. But throughout history, there was also some really famous figures who said they had seen mermaids in real life, so let's run through them really quick. In the second century AD in Syria, there was a bunch of people who kept mentioning mermaid corpses washing up on the shore of their beaches. And it was such a big thing that the governor there in Syria actually wrote a letter to Emperor Augustus of Rome to inform him about all these mermaid corpses. Another historic figure I'm sure you probably heard of is Christopher Columbus during his exploration of the Caribbean. He accounted seeing mermaids and said that he spotted three of them that were mermaids or sirens he said off the coast of Hispaniola in 1493. And he said that unlike the stories that were told about them they weren't beautiful and had like pretty masculine facial features which without a doubt they were probably manatees and actually manatees get mistaken for mermaids quite often so maybe these mermaid sightings were all just manatees in the 1700s famous pirate blackbeard actually mentioned mermaids in his logbooks so one of the most feared pirates in history apparently had a map of waters that he avoided because of mermaid sightings he even instructed his crew on several voyages to stay away from certain charred waters that he called enchanted because either he or his crew had spotted mermaids in that area. The fact that Blackbeard was like scared of mermaids is just unreal. During World War II, some Japanese soldiers claimed they saw these mermaid-like creatures that had spikes down their back. In the Kai Islands of Indonesia, these soldiers kept seeing what they called fishmen and there was not one, but many different sightings. All the sightings were slightly different, but they said they had a mouth like a carp, pink skin, two frog-like fins, and long arms. One of these alleged sightings actually was in a natural lagoon on the island where the soldiers were exploring. They said they saw something thrashing around in the water. Suddenly, this weird frog mermaid creature man jumped out of the water onto a rock and faced the soldier, making weird gurgling noises, and then another one of the same creatures was seen swimming towards them, and they said it didn't look too friendly, so they just opened fire on it. And then those frog mermaid people just disappeared. Then, a more recent one in 1998, just off the Hawaiian island of Kauai, a boat of about 10 people claimed they saw a mermaid. A diver even managed to take a photo of a mermaid swimming. Experts claim it's real. No, really, some mermaid experts said it was authentic. So, the diver said he was 20 minutes off the coast of Kauai when he saw a pod of dolphins and said he saw what was like a woman swimming with them just 10 feet away, keeping up with their extremely fast pace. And that suddenly she jumped into the air revealing her fishtail. The 10 people in the boat claimed that they also saw the mermaid, uh, but that they saw it jump twice out of the water before she disappeared into the water indefinitely. Which, it was probably a dolphin. They have like these spinner dolphins there in Hawaii that like jump out and they spin around and sometimes they do flips and stuff. And it's pretty crazy. I've seen them once. It was really cool. But there's a lot of other alleged sightings throughout history and like reports continue to the present day. It's a really strange phenomenon. Uh, maybe it's manatees. Maybe it's dolphins. Maybe there are mer people. Maybe Glaucus is still out there. And that's all I have for Europe. Um, this video was getting extremely long, so I couldn't do every single country in Europe. But I feel like I covered the best ones. If you have any ideas for videos, just drop them in the comments. I would love to hear what you have to say. And I'll be reading all those comments. Also, join my Discord if you like talking about weird stuff like this. I would love to have a conversation about mermaid kraken stuff with you. But guys, the kraken is out there. If you really think that we're gonna go throughout all of history without finding a giant squid creature that definitely sunk ships, you're wrong. Because the Kraken's out there, we're gonna find it, the Kraken's real. Tell me it's not, it is. If you like this series, just let me know. I'm considering continuing it, but I might stop it if it doesn't do as well. Thank you guys so much for 250,000 subs. You guys are so great. I'm now at 262,000, so we're growing quick. You guys are making my dreams come true. Um, the Kraken's real. Thank you guys for sticking around to the end. If you're here, you're probably deranged just like me. And you probably also think the Kraken is real because it is. And the ocean is extremely deep. Thank you guys for watching this video. And have a great day.